I'm reading in the book of Luke chapter 5. And unusually today I'm going to read the story in the New King James. Nearly King James version. Luke 5 and 1. Luke 5 1. So it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of the Lord, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, also called Tiberias or Galilee, and saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. There's a sermon there. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. I'll announce my title later. I'm not preaching a Memorial Day theme, but what I feel fits with the theme of the Spirit in our church right now. God bless you. You can be seated. I believe that there are no accidents with God. We believe that every promise in the book is ours. It's given to us as his people. I believe that every word Jesus spoke, every place Jesus went, everything Jesus did had purpose. It had intent. In the days of his flesh, there were no accidental meetings. There were no incidental miracles that took place. The writer John said that the world itself could not contain the books that could be written of all that Jesus did in three and a half short years of ministry. But John tells us that these things were written that we might believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that by believing we might have life in His name, through His name. So everything written in this book that Jesus said and did, His words and His works, were recorded for an intentional purpose. The Gospels are a dramatic presentation of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, written for an intention, for a purpose. It is not a complete history of Jesus, everything Jesus said or did, but written to guide us toward eternal life. So with that background, I want you to see this story in the Gospels. There's a multitude pressing around Jesus, and it's hard for Him to really address them standing on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. So He sees two boats that are there to the shore. There's no fishermen in the boats. They are out of the boats, they are up on the shore and they are washing their nets. They're not washing fish scales out of their nets. They're not pulling fish out of their nets. They're just cleaning debris and trash that might have been hauled in as they spent the night fishing. Well, the Bible said that Jesus got into one of the boats. It doesn't say he asked permission, he just did. It happened to be Simon's boat, Simon Peter's boat. And he asked Simon to push out a little from the land. So now he has created a little space, kind of like an altar area, except it's water. And uh, he can see the people. They can all see him. He can teach them, and his voice would 
would carry across the water and perhaps up the hillside. I was looking at satellite images of the Sea of Galilee yesterday just to refresh my memory. And Jesus is sitting in the boat and teaching the multitudes from the boat. He needed some breathing room and Simon's boat provided that. Now these boats are owned by Simon Peter. They're owned by James and John, his business partners, and evidently with their father Zebedee. And Jesus sees Simon Peter, who's the captain of his, of his boat, but now he's a captive on his boat. He's on the boat with Jesus, and he has no choice but to hear Jesus teach. Now, we don't really know that Simon had a good attitude about being there. Uh, the Bible doesn't indicate anything about that. But he had been fishing all night. He had been up all night. They've now come to shore. They've docked their boats, beached them. And now they're, they're working. They're trying to finish so they can catch a little sleep so they can go fish again the next night. But he's there on the boat while Jesus teaches. The Bible doesn't say how long the message was. The Bible doesn't say what Jesus taught. But we just know Simon is now on the boat hearing the sermon and the multitudes are hearing the ministry of Jesus. Now when Jesus borrowed Simon Peter's boat, he didn't make an agreement with him. He didn't sign any waivers. He didn't tell him he would pay him so much per minute or hour to teach from his boat. And it's interesting that, that Jesus is a borrower. Sometimes he will use your stuff or your time with no promise of remuneration that he owes you anything or that you own anything. He might borrow your donkey or your car. He might call your kids into ministry. You never know what Jesus wants to use. But in the case of Simon and his boat, evidently it's in Jesus' mind that he's going to pay a little rent for the use of Simon's boat. He's going to pay him for his trouble. So after the teaching is over, Luke 5 and 4 Jesus speaks to Simon and he said, launch out into the deep and let down your nets, he says plural, for a catch. Get out in some deep water. I want you to use more than one net. And Jesus is talking about something pretty special that he believes and knows is going to happen. But Jesus is not a fisherman. Sometimes I have people ask me questions about things, and I have no background, no education. Through the years, I'll say, I don't give medical advice, and I don't give legal advice. Please don't call me to ask what color car you should buy or what brand. I'm not in that business. I don't know much about that. But I've learned this about God, that when God speaks, when God speaks through a man, when it is God, God is an expert in everything, and if God speaks, it is always perfectly right. When Paul tells those on the boat in Acts 27 that, that there's going to be danger if we go, they disregarded his input because he didn't know anything about sailing. But when God speaks, it's always true and it is always right. And Jesus, as a non-fisherman, seems to be a little bit out of touch with reality. But Simon Peter offers Jesus a dose of reality. Have you ever told God anything like this? Have you ever told the Lord that, sorry Lord, but you don't know what you're talking about? You don't understand my situation. So Simon Peter tells Jesus in verse 5, he answers and says, Master, that's a good title for the Lord, right? Master, master of everything. He doesn't know that yet. Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. We'll stop right there. Look, Lord, we know what we're doing. Obviously, you don't. And we spent all night fishing, 
We lowered our heavy commercial fishing nets into the Sea of Galilee by hand. We dragged them behind the boat. We hauled them up to the boat. We did this over and over all night long. And we didn't catch a single fish. The Sea of Galilee is about 13 miles long, about 8 miles wide, but it's 141 feet deep relative to sea level. It is the lowest freshwater lake in the world. And we don't really know what kind of fish they caught. I, I did a little research on it, and I found that a little over a decade ago, they tried to restock the Sea of Galilee due to overfishing and far agricultural runoff. And, and they put 600,000 tilapia in the Sea of Galilee. And I think they were putting in another 400,000. And they call it St. Peter's fish. And I'm not sure if it was tilapia or not. But they fished and fished and fished the night before. Simon, Peter, Aunt James and John, evidently they worked together. They struck out. They got skunked. They didn't catch one thing. I hate to go fishing and catch nothing. I have been known to keep fishing until I catch something. Just because I don't want to lose. I want to catch something. On Scott Sistrunk's wedding weekend, I fished in Carla's grandfather's farm pond. And David Reaver was ready for me to quit and I finally caught one little bass. And I said, okay, we can go now. I think Peter, James, and John felt like that. They didn't fish half the night. They didn't give it up. This is how they made a living. They fished all night long. Dropping the nets. Dragging the nets. Pulling them up to the boat. And all of that, they caught nothing. Amen. Now... I don't know what Jesus was teaching on Peter's boat that day. I don't know what came in Simon's ears. It doesn't say that he was snoozing while Jesus was teaching. But maybe there was some hope coming into the futility of his empty night of fishing. And so Simon Peter says to Jesus, Luke 5 and 5, just focus on this last phrase. Well, we'll read it all. Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, even though it makes no sense at all, even though this seems irrational, even though this is out of touch with reality, nevertheless, at your word, and only because you told me to, I will let down the net. I don't know if he had faith or he was just obeying, obeying. I don't know if he felt something or he just did something. I've learned that sometimes God doesn't give you a feeling. He just gives you a word. You may not have an emotion, but you have a directive. You might say that Jesus gave him an instruction, but it really was an invitation to something that was beyond rational, beyond reality. Amen. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Reason said, there is no fish here now. They don't even have to be hungry. They just have to be here. We're not using bait. We're using nets. Now, on the Sea of Galilee, as in many places, during the day, the sunlight, the fish would descend, go deep, and stay there at whatever level. At night, they would come nearer the surface to feed. I'll venture to say that Simon, Peter, James, and John, and other commercial fishermen on the Sea of Galilee did not have nets that could dredge 141 feet deep. They were counting on the fish at night feeding on the surface, and, and they could drag their nets, and they could haul in fish. So for whatever reason, the time, the phase of the moon, the, the rain, the weather, I don't know why, but that night before, there were no fish in the area at all. Simon Peter had every reason to believe that nothing was going to happen. 
It was a bad time to fish in the day. It was a bad season of fishing. They had already proven that it was pointless. But nevertheless, at the Lord's word, he would let down the nets again. This is what faith says. That in spite of my circumstances, if God says it, it can happen. It is beyond reality. It is beyond rationale. Amen. And sometimes you act in faith. Sometimes you just act in obedience. Because we've learned that God is not bound by circumstances. When God performs a miracle, he suspends the laws of nature. Amen. We believe and we have learned by experience and from God's word that there is nothing too hard for God. We know that he can part the waters of the Red Sea. We know that he can walk on the water. Amen. He can perform any miracle if he can perform a miracle. Amen. It doesn't, it doesn't matter whether you think it can happen. It just matters if you believe that God does not lie and that you're willing to obey him. Simon Peter is going to oblige the master. He's already followed Jesus to the marriage of Cain of Galilee. He's somewhat of a follower, but he, he went back and he's still in the fishing business. He's not a full-time follower, disciple, or apostle of Jesus Christ. Verse 6. And when they had done this, when they just did what Jesus told them to do. This is really not the heart of my message. But I want to tell some doubters today. I want to tell some people who are trying to think it through and figure it out. And you feel like maybe you know something God doesn't. That he knows what you don't know. He sees what you cannot see. And he is in control of what is out of your control. <laughs> Nevertheless, at your word. When they had done this. Obeyed Jesus and let down the nets. They caught a great number of fish. And their net was breaking. I'm interested to know. Why they didn't fully obey the Lord when he said, let down your nets. They let down their net. And so verse 7, they signals to their partners and the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. Peter, he knew that this was not just a lucky day on the lake. He knew that this was the result of a miraculous event when God, more than a fish whisperer, called schools of fish out of the deep, into the shallow, into the net. So many fish that their net was breaking and their boat was sinking. Just, I'll mention this again maybe later, but Jesus gave them more than they could control or manage. Peter, verse 8, he falls down at Jesus' knees. Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. He doesn't feel worthy to receive this kind of a miracle. I don't know if he's confessing sins in the past or unbelief, but he falls down at the feet of the Lord. And, and those that were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had Taken, amen. I, I don't know exactly what he was feeling, but he was feeling unworthy of such a great miracle. Now on another day in the ministry of Jesus, in the life of discipleship and apostleship for the apostle Peter, Jesus would tell Peter, look, the taxes are due, temple tax. We don't really have any money. I want you to go down to the lake Cast in a line with a single hook. So the apostle Peter knew how to use nets. He must have had a spare fishing pole with him at all times or borrowed one or made one. And he got a line and a pole and went down to the Sea of Galilee and he threw it in and he caught a fish and one fish. And Jesus said, 
I want you to look in that first fish you catch. Now, it implies that he might have caught more, but the first fish you catch, I want you to open his mouth, and when you look inside, you're going to find a coin. And with that coin, I want you to go pay our taxes. Now, if Jesus would have said that on this day, suppose Jesus is there, he's in Peter's boat, he tells him, I want you to go out into the deep, grab your fishing pole, Peter, I want you to just lower a line on the side of the boat and catch a fish. You know there's none here, they're all in the depths, they're all somewhere else, I want to prove to you that I can help you catch a fish. You could have said that that would have been a miracle that day and that could have been the end of the story that he would have caught a single fish and from the single fish he would have had faith in Jesus Christ that Jesus could do what he said he would do. But in this story, I believe that Jesus was saying something about their future. He was saying something about what they would one day do. That he would give them something bigger than they could handle. They could wrap their brain around. He was telling them something. He was creating a paradigm. Verse 10. Got their partners. And Jesus said to them, the last phrase, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So when they brought up their boats to land, it was then that they forsook all and followed Jesus Christ. Jesus told them, in your former life, you caught fish. In your future life, you will catch men. And because of what had happened and what he said, they walked away from boats, nets, business, a rather successful enterprise, and they followed Jesus Christ. Why would they walk away from everything to follow him? And what did they expect their future would look like? What mental picture do you think came to mind as they followed Jesus and they looked into the future that he had called them to? Do you think for a minute that Simon Peter imagined the church dispensation as sitting on a creek bank somewhere and dropping in a line and catching a single fish. I believe that Jesus wanted them to envision something that was beyond meager results and marginal success. He wanted them to get a picture that was bigger than just a farm pond and a brim or a bass that you would pull up on a hook. He wanted them to know that their future would not be one of laziness or leisure. It was a future that would be filled with hard work that would produce extraordinary results. They were looking for something big in the kingdom of God, something greater. They were seeing something from this miracle, a mental picture of what Jesus would one day do. Let's review the verses again. Verse 6. When they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come help them. And they came and filled their boat so that they began to sink. In this miracle, their net was breaking. Their boats were sinking. And from now on, Jesus said in verse 10, from now on, you will catch men. In verse 11, they left everything to follow him. And here's my title. I preached it way years and years ago that I believe Jesus called them to a net-breaking, boat-seeking revival. He called them to a church dispensation that would boggle their mind and blow their mind. It was something bigger than they control, bigger than they could handle. It was bigger than they had ever imagined in their life. I'm not calling you to smallness. I'm not calling you to some marginal success. I'm not calling you to a hook and line future. I'm calling you to a net breaking, boat sinking revival. Can you see what they saw? 
Can you see what they saw? Can you see people that will not fit in the building? Can you see churches being baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Some people. Some people see church growth and church leadership as a hook and line operation. That you've got it all in your hands and under your control and it is manageable. One little, two little, three little Christians. Church with us four and no more. Family owned and operated. Think small, stay small. Monocultural church, like Jerusalem at the beginning. Big, but all Jewish. I know it may seem to you that churches grow one at a time. The Lord added to the church daily, such as we're being saved. But this does not fit the picture that Jesus showed Peter, James, and John. In Luke 5, on this day, on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, I've learned that it may start with one, but it often extends to an entire family or a city, or it can happen even to a nation. The early church in the book of Acts grew by families and cities and entire provincial regions. Acts 2, 3,000 souls. In a single day. 247. The Lord added to the church daily. Acts 4 and 4. The number was about 5,000. Acts 6. The number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. It is estimated that the church in Jerusalem. Numbered some 30,000 believers at its peak. Acts 8. There is great joy in the city of Samaria. Philip initiates a city wide revival in Acts chapter 9 with the healing of a man named Aeneas the whole city turned to the Lord people that lived in Lydda and Sharon and area turned to the Lord in Acts 9 42 when Tabitha or Darkus was raised from the dead many believed in the Lord I'll spare you the balance of the book of Acts that involves more the ministry of Paul than Peter But I wonder what it felt like to Peter when in Acts chapter 10, verse 44, while Peter yet spake the word, the Holy Ghost fell on them that heard the word. I wonder what went through his mind when he saw Gentiles speaking in other tongues for the very first time in history. I wonder if it would have been me, my mind would have raced back to that day in the Sea of Galilee when Jesus taught me that I've got a future for you. I'm going to give you a net-breaking, boat-seeking revival. Amen. I know this is Memorial Day weekend. And I realize we've had 14 months of COVID craziness. Church online from March to May last year. Limited church attendance even now with the social distance seating. I know it's Memorial Day weekend and everyone somewhere else. Except for you and me, right? But I mean in churches across, everybody went somewhere. And we're glad you're here. I I told Shannon, I'm glad you guys took up a whole row. We need you today. (laughs) We've not had a problem with too many guests. We've not run out of baptismal robes. We've not had so many people receive the Holy Ghost that we didn't have enough altar cards or altar counselors to guide those people in their new experience with God I know that some people have become a little laid back I call it COVID complacency some of the COVID margin in our lives may be healthy I'm not preaching that we need to live at a frenzied frenetic pace of life amen but I've been fishing before usually with my brothers 
and you call it Mahi Mahi, Florida Dolphin. When there were so many fish, you were pulling them in the boat as fast as you could. And they bleed everywhere. And it was all over you and all over the boat. And you didn't care. It was messy. It was more than you can manage at one time. But you were pretty excited about it. And you were very busy at it. It wasn't leisure, but it was sure a lot of fun. If your nets are breaking and your boats are sinking, you are busy, you are amped up, you're excited, but it is the greatest joy in all the world to celebrate one or a hundred or a thousand new people born into the kingdom of God. Amen. I thought about why the Lord put this message in my heart. After so many years on a weekend like this. But I thought about this. Memorial Day. It is significant because. Men and women laid down their lives. No, so we could squander our freedom. Or surrender our nation to paganism. Absolutely not. They died. Not so we would silently surrender. To those who do not believe in God. But they died so we could preserve our freedom and that a nation could be built. Jesus did not die for us four and no more. Jesus did not die so churches could be complacent. Jesus did not die so that just you and your family could go to heaven. He purchased this church with his blood. He purchased this church so that the gospel would be preached in all the world as a witness to him before he came back. He purchased this church so we would see a net breaking, boat sinking, revival. And a gathering of lost souls that would blow our minds and break our nets and sink our boats. Something that would be bigger than we can manage. In 2021, we have the ability to cast the gospel net in ways that never existed a couple decades ago. That's why we say, please like, comment, share. Share the good news. That's why we've gone back to saying, please take two business cards before you leave today. We're blessed with social media. We're blessed to live stream and archive our services for other people. You can have an online Bible study with someone anywhere in the entire world if they have internet access. Last week in the Wisconsin District, United Pentecostal Church, their district hosted a statewide crusade. And Brother Josh Herring preached. I I heard about it and I started texting him, thanking him. I texted Brother Booker, the district superintendent. Josh Herring told me we had 500 guest cards, 72 baptized in the arena, 12 to 15 baptized at satellite locations. 50 people testified that they were healed. There are 300 people baptized with the Holy Ghost in the arena. 700 filled with the Holy Ghost in the country of Mexico. In Spain, it was 2 o'clock in the morning, but 11 people were filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. There is no telling what God will do here or what God will do from here. I've just come today to remind you of the picture of the church. That it is a net breaking, boat sinking revival. It is bigger, more powerful, broader than anything we've ever fathomed in our lives. And Jesus said... Don't say it's four months and then comes the harvest. He said, I need you to lift up your eyes. Get get your eyes up. They've been down. Lift up your eyes. And look. Look on the fields, plural. They're already ripe. King James says, white into harvest. They're ready, so ripe that the grain is ready to fall off the stock. He said, I want you to know 
that what I'm going to do has got fields and people groups and through that one woman at the well, that Samaritan sinner woman, the entire city turned to the Lord. I wonder if it kind of set up what happened in Acts 8 with Philip. In the book of Revelation chapter 7 verse 9. After this I beheld and lo a great multitude. A great multitude. Now I know people like to quote, straight as a gate, narrow as a way that leads the life of few that be that find it. And compared to the billions of people who have ever lived on the face of the earth. And Jesus was saying that there's a skinny gate. It leads to a narrow way. If you're going to go to heaven, you can't go in just any gate. You've got to make up your mind to go. When you go through that gate, don't just think you've got a lot of latitude to live however you want to live. It's a narrow way. There's a way to live. It's a, a path of holiness. Amen? Amen? And, and you've got to find it. You're not going to wander into it. You've got to look for it, Jesus said. But in Revelation, that few becomes a multitude. John saw it in Revelation 7 and 9. A multitude which no man could number. Of all nations and kingdoms and people and tongues. And they stood before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed with white robes. Everybody that got there was holy. They were robed in the righteousness of God. And they had palms in their hands. They didn't have willows that are signs of mourning. But they had palms that are signs of joy and victory. And there was a multitude that were so many people that you could not count them. You could say that somewhere in the history of the world that somebody's nets were breaking. Somebody's boats were sinking. That God had given somebody somewhere. A revival bigger than they can control or manage.